Thank you to Catherine Proudfoot and the others at the Welfare Center for inviting me to do this talk. I'm pleased to speak to you today on a very tough, tough subject, how do veterinarians navigate the complexities of health, welfare, and owner attachment in the context of international challenges for dog breeding. I'm Brenda Bonnet, and I'm veterinary science officer at the uh, International Partnership for Dogs, and we're online at dogwellnet.com. And my the talk will be posted uh, yeah, under blogs, Brenda's blogs, and you'll be able to get the PDF and study the slides that I go over very quickly. As a background, the health and welfare of dogs with extreme conformation, especially brachycephalics, continues to be a hot topic internationally, especially in Europe, but really everywhere. Uh, and many of the issues apply to dog breeding in general. Um, it's ranged from conversation controversy to conflict. Um, some pretty ugly uh, conflicts actually, litigation and legislation, concern, outrage, and anger uh, as these topics are discussed and events have transpired. Professional organizations like the vet organizations and international vet organizations have come out with position papers and uh, statements, sometimes supportive, sometimes angry often sort of boilerplate very big picture and they don't always help the individual veterinarians who are on the front lines caught between massively increased numbers of dogs, extreme owner attachment, and practical moral and ethical issues. And I'll talk a bit more about petitions in a while, but petitions against breeding and cries for more responsibility by dog breeders or by owners are important, but they do not relieve veterinarians of their responsibilities. So this talk is going to focus on veterinarians. And discussions have expanded to include many broader issues of dog breeding and breeders and all of this, the veterinary aspect as well, is aggravated by pandemic problems. I mean, what isn't? So to quickly outline, the goals for today are to cover the context of recent international and national developments, looking at eventually what steps can individual veterinarians take for their own well-being as well as the well-being of clients and dogs and then what should veterinary organizations do and just as an aside the international partnership for dogs has been involved with these issues for years providing evidence-based and multi-stakeholder resources and there's many resources on dogwellnet.com and I'll provide another list at the end of the talk. As an outline, we'll start, we'll discuss the array of stakeholders involved in these issues, review definitions of health and welfare and human-dog interactions in the context of this problem, and briefly review the history of veterinary involvement from the late 1800s and early 1900s up through the 1960s, early 2000s, and now. This outlines all the stakeholders that uh, have an influence on global dog health and welfare and uh, separated a little bit into the supply and demand side. So the public and individual consumers are of course the driving feature um, on the demand side and kennel breed clubs and other breeders and sourcers of dogs on the supply side. With vets, welfare groups, pet industry, legislators, all involved, all uh, have to be part of solutions. 
There's lots of information on international actions on dog wellness, but I'll just briefly go through a couple. Over the last couple of years, the Netherlands has uh, brought in new legislation to support enforcement of existing legislation. Um, they're calling for measurement of the craniofacial ratio in dogs and refuse breeding of dogs with shorter muzzles. Um, it's not going that well or that smoothly and veterinarians are caught in the middle of that. There's been legal action in Norway where a welfare group sued breeders, breed clubs, and the kennel club for not following the law. And that has uh, been decided, but the possible wider implications are very unclear. Uh, many countries, Sweden, Ireland, and others, have legislation in place or coming along soon with variable enforcement about impacts of breeding on offspring. And some countries are limiting um, appearance at dog shows by compromised breeds. And then we have petitions from veterinarians in various countries um, looking to spur on more work uh, and attention to health and brachycephalics. Facaba has come out with a video of veterinarians begging people not to buy these dogs. And several uh, petitions are in the works internationally actually calling for breed bans. Uh, not as much in uh, US and Canada, but uh, it's coming. If we bring the legislation and legislative uh, legal aspects down to, in a nutshell, many laws have been written, few welfare laws are well enforced, and that becomes a problem. Sometimes the language is essentially unenforceable, sometimes it's a political statement. But um, I want to mention about uh, the, the aspects that have looked at uh, the influence on the progeny. So in Norway, they have a law that requires all animals be bred with good function and health and prohibits any breeding that alters or perpetuates hereditary traits that adversely affect uh, the progeny, the animals. Uh, physical and mental functions or reduces their ability to engage in natural behavior or in some way provokes general ethical reactions. In Queensland, Australia, their welfare standards include a statement that a dog with an exhibited deleterious heritable condition that has the potential to adversely impact the welfare of the progeny must not be used for breeding. Similar statements or laws are uh, in the law of many countries. Again, enforcement is uh, a problem or is not always happening. So when I've worked on this, I've, I've tried to take and uh, reflect on the language we use with animal welfare and relate that to some of the legislative actions uh, that are out there. So I'm sure everybody on this call is aware of the five freedoms, the gold standard for animal welfare, originally done for individual animals to check out their current welfare situation, freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal behavior, freedom from fear and distress. So if we take that and say, what about heritable conditions for the current dog, but also for the offspring that would come from a breeding animal or a breeding pair of animals, we can say these are the progeny likely to be able to reliably achieve, should the individual dog with their characteristics and their progeny reliably achieve the five freedoms? And what are some of the conditions that can be passed on to the offspring that should be considered? I won't go into total detail on this slide, but I hope you download the talk 
and read it and think about it. Um, this looking at heritable conditions relative to the five freedoms, of course, breathing difficulties, locomotor difficulties, uh, skin problems can cause discomfort, uh, pain injury and disease, not looking at acute injuries, but chronic uh, bad spines, bad hip dysplasia, etc., uh, are passed on and influence pain injury and disease. Normal behavior we probably don't focus on enough. Um, but there's many uh, French bulldogs out there with very short spines and hemivertebrae and missing vertebrae, and they can't bend in half and they can't clean their hind end on their own. And that's pretty normal behavior for a dog. And also the breeds that can't uh, breed and whelp on their own, that's also um, not being able to perform normal behaviors. And the box on the right side relates to confirmation and uh, other attributes, traits of the dog that can be expected to be passed on if selected for by the breeder. Or if you have two dogs with short skulls, you'll get puppies with short skulls. Uh, and that goes for skin folds and basic body conformation, vertebral abnormalities. Um, and inability to reproduce. So that's how I put these things together in the language of the five freedoms compared to the language of these legislations. And uh, you can certainly see the case can be made that dogs are being bred with a high probability of producing problems in the offspring. So talking about changes over time um, and not worrying about the 10,000 years from wolf to today. Uh, these are two skulls of British Bulldogs from 1870 and 2010, so 140 years and market changes. And I think we would all agree that the skull on the right, which represents the desired type for Bulldogs nowadays, uh, would be passed on to the offspring and would almost certainly be associated with various health challenges. We can look on the inside with CT scans and on the top is a dolichocephalic breed and on the bottom is a brachycephalic breed. And in the brachycephalic, the turbinates are uh, reduced and messed up and the sinuses are smaller and the palate is longer and the tongue is bigger. Um, and again, all those characteristics of that internal and external skull are likely to be passed on in breeding. In fact, it's selected for, that confirmation is being selected for in breeding. Now these are pictures that I hope you would never post on your uh, clinic website because they are typical of funny but not at all funny pictures of compromised breeds. Why do uh, French Bulldogs sit in these funny ha-ha positions? Um, Hemivertebrae is, this is a slide from uh, Professor Moses in Australia, and he says 80% of French Bulldogs have some degree of hemivertebrae or missing vertebrae. Danica Banish at Davis estimates it to be 95%. Um, related, I think, both to genetic factors and to breeding dogs for shorter backs because of a specific type that's wanted. And similarly, skin folds, corneal ulcers are a function of the conformational anatomy of the head and can be passed on to offspring. So how did we get to this point of having um, these desirable pets with all these undesirable characteristics. 
in the early 1900s and even the late 1800s, people were uh, putting up complaints for the changes to the British Bulldog. In the 1960s, veterinarians started to get involved in that uh, research uh, on BOAS and respiratory problems and brachycephalics started in the late 1950s. So we started to know it was a real problem, but nothing much was done on it. And uh, you can read uh, about that in our chapter I'll tell you about later on international aspects. But veterinarians uh, looking at extreme breeding uh, were focusing on hip dysplasia, which was common in the most popular breeds at that time, uh, Labradors and German Shepherds. And although they realized BOAS and brachycephaly was a problem, there were so few of them, uh, it didn't sort of warrant their full attention. Uh, flash forward to the 2000s, increasing recognition of problems in some pedigree dogs, especially in brachycephalics. Um, lots of educational efforts from RSPCAs and different groups uh, educating the public on the problems with brachycephalic dogs, the problems with uh, BOAS and other issues in these dogs. And that led to, wait for it, a massive increase in popularity of French Bulldogs, Pugs, and others. Uh, not really sure why that happened, but uh, we can certainly say that these major efforts to educate people against them did not work well, did not have the desired consequences. And how did this happen that we knew brachycephaly was a problem in the 60s and it only became this massive problem in the 2000s? Uh, maybe we've been caught, it's been surprised by the sheer force of popularity of dogs with um, short muzzles. We like to blame that on celebrities and the media. But research has shown, and I'm sure uh, Rowena Packer will cover this in, in her talk that is a later webinar. Um, it's mainly a desire of people, something about the appearance of the dog that appeals to them. And even though they know it will be expensive and a problem, they just really want them. Uh, and sometimes they think it's great because they don't need exercise, which almost surely relates to their lack of ability to take much exercise. But anyway, we can complain about owners who just don't get it and we can't get through to them and we can't educate them. But what about the veterinarians and veterinary paraprofessionals who own and even breed these dogs? They must get it, they must understand, and still at some level, they think it's okay. So in their worldview, it's okay. But here is a very extreme dog. Uh, and the top graph on the right there is the increase in registered French Bulldogs in the United States. Those are only dogs registered with the AKC, not popular, popular or backyard bred dogs. And uh, the numbers went up, that goes, I think, to 2017 or 2018. In the UK, they think up to 40% of dogs, uh, I think, in the UK, certainly registered with the UK uh, Kennel Club, are now brachycephalics. In the lower part of uh, that graph, it shows that these dogs have reduced longevity. And uh, the bottom part of the graph is veterinary care and life statistics from Swedish insurance showing, showing a marked increased risk in French Bulldogs for spinal problems compared to uh, the blue line there, which is for all breeds. So there's ample evidence that all these things are occurring, are challenges in these dogs. 
and somehow the veterinary profession has in some way been part of allowing that to happen. I just throw that out for you to think about. So essentially what makes this such a tough problem is the two basic components, the concern for the welfare of the dogs and what people want, and that's breeders, owners, everybody else. It's further complicated within each category, concern for individual dog welfare. Right now the dog may need treatment, may need surgery, and then the breeds and the future. And um, what we do now will influence what the future is for these dogs. Uh, and it's a tough thing to put all that together. Um, owners want their cute, funny fur babies. They like extremes. Show breeders want a specific type. Commercial breeders presumably are just supplying the demand. And if we could change that, uh, they might supply different dogs. But this combination makes it a tough problem to deal with. So our challenge moving forward is to figure out how we move from this disconnect uh, to what we'd like to see is situations that are good for dogs and good for people. So let's look at a few definitions of health and welfare in dogs and the role of human-animal interactions. Everyone wants healthy dogs with good welfare. At least everyone says just that. But when it comes to making specific definitions, it's very challenging and conflicts arise. So there needs to be clear definitions of dog health and welfare, but these items exist on a spectrum and it's not always that easy to define them. So in terms of the spectrum, at one end we can say health is the total absence of disease, but few of us live our whole life absolutely free of any kind of health problems, but we might still consider ourselves relatively healthy. Uh, maybe we should be talking about an absence of preventable disease or come up with an acceptable level of disease and then do we focus on rate or risk or both? Uh, these are some of the challenges. With welfare, it's quite easy to say an absence of pain and suffering, but again, it's not that absolute and perhaps we should be talking about an adequate or acceptable level of welfare and how is that defined? But it's very clear that different people, different stakeholders have different attitudes about what's okay and what's not okay. So additional problems arise when we generalize across different cultures, areas, regions, across disease or uh, breeds because there's no one size fits all. And I think a lot of the problems nowadays are partly because uh, we try to generalize too closely. So it's not black and white, these de definitions, and then we have to consider human-animal interactions. And that's any place where animals come into contact with people, everything people and dogs do together, the human-animal bond, it's how animals enrich our lives and society, etc. And those attitudes and behaviors also impinge on our understanding and acceptance of uh, issues of health and welfare. So when we look at the spectrum of roles and relationships with people, there's a lot of regional cultural uh, influences on this. And it's not strictly separated by East, West, developed, developing nations, um, prevailing sentiment uh, in the US, for example, is quite different than in Europe. Uh, but if we look at the spectrum at one side, we say dogs are sentient beings and they have certain rights. 
some people might be extreme to one end of the spectrum and say they're equal to humans. At the other end of the spectrum, dogs are property, chattels. The owner decides uh, perhaps within uh, the limits of actual abuse. So different societies break that down at different levels. But in almost all societies, dogs are commodities. They're bought and sold. And we will talk about that um, later. So uh, in the spectrum, as I say, in the United States, generally people, groups, their needs and desires or their livelihood or business comes above the rights of the animals. Uh, some places in Europe are much more to the other side. So one more spectrum I want to discuss is that leads to the words dominion and stewardship somewhere between animals are there for us to do with as we please or animals are there for us to take care of. Uh, and again, it's not black and white. It's not everybody agrees where those differences come. So what we're looking for is some kind of balance between what pets need, what people want, uh, and it's a challenge. Can we achieve a reasonable balance if we understand the spectrum? But as we learned during the pandemic, people want what they want and everything we taught people about careful consideration before they got a pet went out the window when they were bored and the kids were driving them nuts and they ran out and got a pandemic puppy. And now we have problems uh, dealing with the numbers and people are going back to work and struggling to deal with the animals. So it's a challenging situation. Well, let's look at words and actions of veterinarians and how we've been uh, part of the situation. Have we been complicit? Probably most of us at some time have said, yes, well, that's quite normal in this breed. And or we've agreed with someone who said, oh, the breather, breeder told me it was normal for the dog to make noise when it was breathing. That's just normal for the breed. Well, we may have gone along with it, but most of us know it's not normal for a dog. It's typical in the breed. And perhaps we should be a little bit clearer about that. And there have been situations uh, widespread of people not stressing the health issues uh, involved, maybe because there's a long list, um, not necessarily recording in the record because <clears throat> we don't want to upset the owner by saying what's wrong with the dog, uh, especially when they just come in with a little puppy. And of course, there's a lot of, well, they have the dog and they love the dog and I don't want to upset them. It's a, it's a hard situation for a practicing vet, veterinarian. And I'll talk a little bit about this next point uh, in a couple of minutes. But is there a conflict of interest between our concerns for the individual dog, our concerns for the owner, our business side of veterinary medicine, and uh, a conflict between short-term and long-term needs and goals. I'd like to direct you to an excellent resource, which I assume most of you have probably found as it was uh, published last fall, The Health and Welfare of Brachycephalic Flat faced companion animals, a text that was edited by Rowena Packer and Dan O'Neill, and they both wrote a couple of chapters. Uh, it's divided into two parts. The first part is uh, <clears throat> some of the things I've been talking about, as well as research on owners and attitudes, epidemiology. Um, and the second half of the book is on uh, medical and surgical treatment of dogs, but it's really fantastic uh, and needed by vets in practice. Uh, 
myself and a couple of colleagues wrote uh, a chapter on international aspects. Uh, I've mentioned some of it. You can uh, read it to find out more about who's done what, when, where, and what has and hasn't worked and what's being tried. Uh, I'll also uh, talk a little bit about the chapter on ethics and the chapter on communication. I wrote a, a blog called Veterinarians and Brachycephalic Dogs, Ethics and Reality uh, about the textbook. Uh, in the text, there's a lot of great information on research done on owners. And again, I think you'll hear about that from Rowena. Uh, owners don't recognize health problems in dogs that are even are suffering from them. And they acquire these dogs uh, regardless of knowing about health problems and costly veterinary care, and even that they might not live long. Uh, in the textbook, chapter four is ethical challenges of treating brachycephalic dogs. And it's a very challenging but excellent chapter to read. And uh, they talk about the fact that uh, veterinarians are at risk of a conflict of interest because of the nature of veterinary, veterinary medicine. And they ask veterinarians to think about whether how they deal with welfare of, for example, brachycephalic dogs, how much of it is uh, impinged upon by the business side. Uh, I discuss that the ba there's few balanced directions for the caring veterinary professional in a busy practice. Um, how do you cope with appointments that are too short and too packed to have life-changing discussions with the client? What options are there uh, when up to 50% of uh, practitioners, depending on the country you're in, now work in corporate practices and they may not have control over decisions about which clients to see or what major efforts can be in, um, undertaken. Uh, and we're making money as a harsh real reality. But there's also a chapter in the book on communication and it outlines communication strategies that can be used to um, approach this uh, subject with clients. Um, and I can't cover it today, but I encourage you to read it. But of course, veterinarian pra veterinarians in practice today, especially under conditions of the pandemic, are stretched thin. And the challenge of these nuanced conversations is huge. So in a nutshell, we have a lot of clients with compromised dogs who don't want to hear about it. Owners are extremely attached. Veterinarians normalize problems because they don't want to be confrontational and are pressed for time. So that results in a level of cognitive dissonance which challenges veterinarians. And uh, veterinarians may treat the patient in front of them and just hope that someone else will fix the wider problem. And that may feed into other problems we know are going on in the veterinary world uh, with stress. So more complexity. Other actions being taken, vets in the UK have made up uh, signs about how expensive these dogs are when they get sick. You can look at that more later if you wish. Uh, the petitions and the calls for banning, I've written uh, a VIN article uh, and a blog about that these vet bans, uh, vets banning breeds is a very challenging situation and likely to have unintended consequences, even if it can have. Um, the request, the, the attempt to invoke breed bans is, uh, I think, a mainly an emotional response uh, when you don't know what else to do. I'm um, not sure vets really want to see all brachies gone or what will come next if brachies go and people still want extreme dogs. All of this is going to result, uh, require a change in culture. 
um, values, human behavior, and an examining of personal values and what you do about them. Um, this isn't a judgment, but it's just if your behaviors don't fit with your values, you will struggle personally. And uh, that's a concern. So even though we accommodate all these different viewpoints on the spectrum of attitudes and approaches, uh, there's deeper reasons why it can be important to really understand what your personal feelings are about uh, the challenges you're dealing with. And uh, it's the same for breeders. They all say they, they want health and longevity, but they don't select for it. Uh, and I've also talked about the conflicts um, for veterinarians and having to... Um, draw the line somewhere. So I would suggest that you don't uh, help breed compromised dogs and don't do uh, a lot of cesareans on them, but it's a challenging situation. I'm going to make a couple of strong statements here about pedigree dog health and welfare. Uh, I don't think the optimal outcomes will be achieved simply by doing a few more health tests before breeding. Uh, many of the biggest problems arise from big picture problems, confirmation, lack of longevity, inbreeding, and conditions for which there are no health tests. So health testing is great. Using DNA tests and hip dysplasia x-rays, et cetera, is very important, but it's not going to be enough to get us out of some of the worst uh, health and welfare challenges that we're facing. Um, it relates to the de desire of what people want, and that's a behavioral change that's needed. And we may need to think about outcrossing, and the pedigree world's not really ready for that. Uh, the problems uh, of dog health and welfare relate the worst ones relate to human behaviors and attitudes across all stakeholders. So if we can't change that, if we can't work on human behavior change, uh, our accomplishments will be limited and slow. Dogs are commodities. Yes, they're sentient, but in our world, they're bought and sold. The market and associated problems are driven more by demand and consumers, but we have trouble to deal with consumers or change them so we focus more on the supply side for better and for worse. What can you do? Well change even one viewpoint and start with yourself. Affirm your ethical principles, examine your behavior. As I've said if there's a disconnect it may cause you stress and uh, identifying even small steps that can move in the right direction can be helpful. Uh, not normalizing problems, recording issues in the medical records, talking to clients kindly and compassionately, but honestly about the challenges in their dogs. Don't propagate the problem for the future. Now, this is a tough one when you're dealing right here, right now with problems in practice. But if we're going to make the world a better place for dogs in the future, we have to uh, maybe spay and neuter the dogs that require surgical alterations. Um, Make sure you participate in registries for these surgeries if they're available in your country. Uh, don't assist compromised dogs or sick dogs or dogs with skin infections or atopy or anything to breed in the first place. And don't engage in multiple electric, elective surgeries for births. And I realize it's challenging to organize that. Um, talk to your clients, talk to veterinarians and techs. Uh, that own these dogs, find out why, uh, try to move their viewpoints a little bit. Uh, lead by example, and don't post and share not funny pictures of 
of dogs or compromised breeds. Don't go along with the idea that it's funny, uh, that they snort or faint or anything like that. And then uh, you may want to lobby your professional association. I'll tell you in Canada that the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association is being very collaborative on this. We have a series of lectures at the CVMA convention and a collaborative uh, presentation with the Canadian Kennel Club. Um, but obviously uh, they need input from people and uh, lobby the pet industry against the use of uh, these dogs in advertising. This sl slide is a list of things veterinarians might do uh, to move in an evolution or revolution style from where they're at today. I won't go into it in detail. It's something you need to read about and think about. And so what can you do? Promote healthy breeds and healthy breeding. Try to educate everybody you can and do what you can. It's complex. You won't be able to solve the problem. And when it gets to be too much, grab a cat and take a nap. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions.